right. Well, thanks first of all for being here. It's great to be here among a group of developers. And I want to thank the organizers for uh, organizing this, having us over. So I want to talk about something that we have to deal with on an everyday basis. But I want to start by asking the question, how many of us here are programmers in some form or the other? OK, how many of us are managers? Maybe people who do architecture roles? So a lot of programmers and those who are architects probably grew from being programmers. And one of the things I think we all can agree upon as a group of programmers is that we love to sit and write code. And when we write code, we expect the machine to understand what we do. We're extremely logical. And this also makes it really hard for us to communicate with the rest of the world because things are very obvious to us. And we are like, why don't they get it? And also, as a programmer, you are used to the curtness of compilers screaming at you all the time. So we are pretty shameless in that regard, right? Because we get yelled at every day from the systems that we program in. And so we tend to develop this kind of a binary mode of communication. We think, we say, we get things done, and we love doing it. And unfortunately, though, that also has a problem in how we behave and how we interact with people. I was at the optometrist getting my eyes examined, and my optometrist asked me, what do you do for a living? And I said, I'm a programmer. And she didn't say anything. She kept quiet. And then about five, 10 minutes later, she said, uh, Venkat, what do you do for a living? I said, I told you, I'm a programmer. And she said, yes, I heard you the first time. But you look almost normal. That's why I wanted to ask you again. And we have this impression on people that we are antisocial. And I beg to differ. I totally disagree with it. And sometimes people confuse us. I speak a lot on stages, so people think that I love talking. Quite honestly, I'm an introvert. If you ever catch me in an airplane, I'll be the quietest person in the world. The other day, I was traveling with my wife, honestly, and I literally sat down with my wonderful wife. And the, even my, before my bottom could hit the seat, my laptop was, laptop was open, I was coding. The flight attendant came and said, already you're on it. And my wife is like, leave him alone, that's just him. And that's the way I am. I would rather sit and just work, don't bother me. And I'll be the most antisocial person as per this description. But then I figure out that the person next to me is also a programmer. This changes everything. Now we got to talk about garbage collection, to concurrency, to memory management too. And it'll be a riot for the rest of the flight, isn't it? So I have this opinion that programmers are not antisocial. We're just social among the right kind of people. But the point really is, if we want to succeed in what we do, we got to rethink about how we behave as well. Now, the question, of course, is how many of you have to make any decision and maybe change things in your work? OK, how many of you work? <laughs> Let me ask you the question again. How many of you have to change something at work? That's all of us, right? This is our job. You might have the best idea in the world. You say, this is the most amazing design, the most amazing architecture. I've analyzed this trade-off. This is brilliant. And that idea is absolutely no use until somebody also thinks that's worth pursuing. So our job is not to innovate. Our job is to innovate and communicate and effect change. That's the sad part of our lives. Trust me, I'd be very happy to keep typing on the keyboard and spend my day doing it, but I do have to talk to my customers. I do have to talk to my clients. I have to talk to my bosses. I have to talk to my colleagues. I have to talk to my subordinates. I've got to talk to everybody in the world and convince them this is worth doing. We should change what we do. Our life revolves around our ability to effect change. As a programmer, I love coding, but over the years I realized, however hard it may be, I've got to do something extra, something different, because my ideas are only as good as others embracing it. And so, I'm a huge fan of this one quote by Thomas Paine. I love this quote, I follow this quite often and remind myself and others about it. And that is lead, follow, or get out of the way. And this is a good motto to follow. When you're working with people, either you want people to, you know, that you can follow, 
you want them to lead or you want them to follow. And the worst group of people are the ones who will do neither. And they're just tumbling blocks and keep whining about things. That doesn't help. So lead, follow, or get out of the way. But the question we often ask is this, and this is a question I get asked every single day. It happened yesterday. I was doing a workshop. It happened the day before and the day before. Every day, people will come to me and say, I've got this idea. I've got this uh, solution. How do I convince other people to do this? This is a very common question every day people ask me. How do I convince somebody to take this idea and adopt it? So why is it so hard for others to change? And it's so incredibly difficult for us to think, right? This is obvious why we should do this. Why wouldn't they want to change? This could be in your family. Maybe you're trying to get a child to change the way they do things. This happens for all of us who are grown. Some of us are at the age where we got to convince our parents to change things. That's even more difficult than having children change it. Some of us have to have colleagues, some of us have to have friends change things, some of us have to have spouses change things, and then of course at work, we got colleagues and bosses and everybody else and customers and clients. Why can't they get it? Why wouldn't they change it? And this is frustrating. And people often ask the question, how can I convince others to make the change? And here's the sad fact. Because invariably I ask the person the question that is really hard and they don't like to hear this question. And the question I often ask is, first ask the question, are you convinced? We think we are convinced, but not really. We are somewhat convinced. Sometimes we throw our hands up and say, if only my boss allowed me to do it, I would have done this. That is so comforting because I don't have any guilt anymore because I can blame it on the bosses. If the management were to allow us, we would have done all these wonderful things, but they didn't. But deep down, are we really convinced? We may be infatuated about an idea. We may be excited about an idea, but being convinced about it requires a lot more. It requires us to dig deeper into things, do analysis, evaluation, and come with pros and cons so we can listen to people and address their concerns and questions rather than saying, this is great, we got to do this. So it requires a lot more than that. So what I want to talk about here today in the next about 40 minutes is what are the things we can do to effect change? And yes, we're all good and eager to learn about this next library and next uh, framework or the next API, but how can we convince other people that what we want to use is the right thing for them to use? It could be a change in technical level, could be change in organization level, could be change in health level, whatever finance level, anything that you want to. How do we achieve that? The very first, the first step in solving a problem is to actually understand it. We are so eager often time to sell a solution we tend to forget to take the time to understand what the problem is. And sometimes we have to ask the question, what's the real problem we're trying to solve? If you don't know what the real problem is, then how could the solution fit the problem you're trying to solve? So the very first step is to just slow down a little bit, pause, and ask the question, have I really understood the problem first? And sometimes we think we do. This is why when I sit down in meetings, I want people to talk about the problem, not talk about the solution. And people get frustrated. Let me tell you how to solve it. Like, hang on a second. Can we talk about what we are trying to solve? Sometimes what's even funny is they'll be talking about two different solutions because they have two different problems in mind. And you're sitting there scratching your head. That doesn't make any sense to me. And then you say, what are you trying to solve? And you realize they both are talking about something completely different. Miscommunication happens a lot. And so we need to really take the time to ask the question, do we understand the problem first? Then, of course, each of us have a solution in mind. The worst thing you can do is try to push a solution to a problem. Because when you try to push a solution to a problem, you are eager to solve the problem in a certain way. But the point is, is there a better way? Is there a different way? I came across this story by a pragmatic programmer, which right blew my mind. He was at a client site, and the client wanted them to implement a software. And they said, we want to implement a software, and you want to have a software to 
you know, which will have RFIDs on all the documents. As you go through the buildings, you will know where the document is at any time. So if you have a stack of papers on your you know, desk, we can clearly use RFID to find out where the document is. This manager goes on to describe this application they want them to build. If you're a consultant, this is like, woo, this is amazing. Because a client has no clue what they're doing, this is opportunity, right? But they had integrity. He was listening to them and said, thank you for that. That's a great solution, I admire you. But what if you buy papers that are of different color? And he just said that, and the guy is like, oh, we don't have to build a software then. It's like, man, you can if you want to spend the money and build a software, but if you just color code the papers, you know exactly on your st you know, stack of papers what you have, and they're like, thanks, we don't need to waste money building the product. Sometimes we are hung up on a solution. And we're like, that's the way to solve it. But what if there's a simpler way? We need to take the time to understand it. So one of the things I try to follow is, never solve a problem until you have three different solutions presented in front of you. I want three different solutions. Don't give me one, give me three. I want to be able to look at three solutions and evaluate the pros and cons of them. And in the process, as we discuss, Maybe we'll find some trade-offs and, and understand this a lot better. So the worst way to solve a problem is to find one solution and be so hard in pushing it. And sometimes it's good to have a little bit of a humbleness and doubt in ourselves. Hey, I'm a big fan of unit testing. Great. You have to unit test every damn thing. Wrong. Because there are times when that's the right solution. There are times when that's not the right solution. I got hired into a project, and the, and the manager said, we're running behind schedule, and we are not going to make it. And our only goal is to finish this project in a reasonable time so we can get the funding and move forward. And the team is just not able to deliver software, period. Can you please come and help me? And I'm like, sure. So I relocated to the city for a few months, and I'm like, I'm going to be here with the team, and I'm going to work. And I'm a big fan of unit testing. I'm a big fan of automated testing. They had none of it. I could have told them, you guys are all clowns for doing this. If you only do automated testing, life will be great. Let's take the time to do automated testing. I would have failed the project entirely doing it. So we had to really look at this and say, what are your problems? Why are you having trouble delivering software? Let's understand that. And we figured out, three things that were blocking them. By the way, none of the three things was related to automated testing. And we fixed the three things. I'm not even exaggerating. We finished the product two weeks before the scheduled deadline. He said, Venkat, this has never happened in my company. We always deliver late. I cannot believe we actually are done two weeks ahead. I'm, I'm now like, so can we now talk about good things we can do, like automated testing? Because you gain their confidence, you gain their trust. It is like saying, exercising is good for you, right? Eating good is good for you, right? So a patient just arrived in the emergency, and the doctor says, if you only exercise and ate well, you wouldn't be here. Get up and run on the treadmill. That's the easiest way to die. That doesn't make any sense, right? So we have to ask the question, what are the solutions that are appropriate to a given problem, and then find out what will get us to the solution, rather than saying, that's the answer, let's go do it. So don't push one solution, ask for multiple different ideas, and look at the pros and cons, evaluate the trade-offs, and figure out what may make sense based on a given context. It also helps a great deal not to tell a team exactly the solution you want them to push, but encourage the team to understand the problem. If the team understands the problem, then they have a lot more involvement in solving it for you. If they're not given an opportunity to understand the problem and participate in the solution, they feel like they're on a mandate. Hey, why are you doing it? That's beyond, oh, the worst words in English. Please never say this to me, because I get really angry when I hear this. The worst words in English, this is beyond my pay grade. I cringe when I hear this word. It's beyond my pay grade. What the hell does that mean? It means I want to be indifferent. I want to wash my hand. I just don't want to do anything that I can be 
possibly part of. That is not the attitude you want from, my, from your people. But I also ask the question, why do they have that attitude? Maybe because we never empowered them. We kept telling them, do this, that's it. Your job is to do this. Don't ask me questions. Do this for me. Well, instead, if we bring them on board, if they are part of really understanding the problem, if they are part of devising solutions to the problem, guess what's going to happen? When I was asked to solve problems, when I was involved in the process of understanding and solving, you got my buy-in. I am there rooting for you for this to succeed. I'm not there to just fulfill a mandate. So you want these people to be part of your team and work for you, so it's important to bring them on board. But one of the problems also on the flip side is, you could be a manager or an architect or a lead who says, hey, here's a problem, go figure it out. Uh, what do I do? Don't bother me, figure it out. Well, that's not gonna help either on the other side. Because in that case, you just threw them into a problem, but you haven't given them the support that they need. So there is one of the things to keep in mind is, when we are faced with a lot of things, it becomes really hard. But I'll share with you one experience I went through. This was quite a hard experience for me. Um, there was a company, I cannot say the name here, they're a very large insurance company in the US. Everybody who knows about insurance business in the US know their name. So the VP of R&D called me and said, I need to talk to you. I got your name from somebody. You come from a trusted source. I need to talk to you. So I'm on the phone with the VP. And he said, they have 7,000 programmers. You can imagine. They got 7,000 programmers writing code. And they got an architectural committee with 50 architects. The committee of 50 is worse than the mafia. <laughs> if you even think of doing something different, they will hunt you and kill you down. And he said, my architectural committee is the most powerful part of my company. I'm the VP. I have no power in front of the architectural committee. That's the way the company is laid out. If the architectural committee says, do this, I have to follow it. Please come and help me. I said, what's wrong with what you have? He said, because the architecture committee is telling us we should program using struts. I'm not exaggerating. They were programming in struts in 2015. <laughs> I said, seriously? He's like, yeah, please help me. What do you want me to do? Come and tell them they are fools. Come and tell them they should change. I said, look, you've tried that already. If they don't listen to you, they have much less reason to listen to me. I have no power. I have no money. I'm not even tall. <laughs> they're not going to listen to me. So why would you want me to come and tell them change? And they're like, we will show you the door and they kick me out. So he said, so what do you want to do? I said, I won't tell them what to do, period. But if you will give me one day, just give me one day, in the morning, I will rant, I will talk. We go to lunch, and I'll come back, I will not talk, I will listen. And they can ask any question they want, I'll answer. I will never tell them what to do. He's like, fine, I've tried everything, if that's what you want to do, come on over. So I go there, I didn't offend them, I didn't kind of ridicule them, I didn't ask them what they use, because I know, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> and I just said to them, Hey folks, you're building these enterprise applications. Here's the problem you're solving. Let me tell you what's available today in the market. And I showed them, and, I, and they know that I don't, I don't work for any of these companies, so I'm not trying to sell them a product. They know I'm unbiased. And I just gave them the options available in the morning. Here are the technologies, here are the ways you can use it, here's what it gives you, and, and so on. So I went in the afternoon, and they said, how do you do this? How do you do this? We have this problem, we have that problem. And for every question, I sincerely had three answers, one of three answers for them. For some questions, oh, you're much better off using this library or this framework because here's why it's going to be better for you. Mm. Hey, another question, you know what? It doesn't matter. What you're doing is fine. Or what are you going to do here will work too. And for a third question, I will be honest about it you are not going to get a good answer from any of these tools. What you're doing is actually better. And so they're sitting and thinking, whoa, this guy's not trying to sell me anything. 
He's just giving me the options to consider. A month goes by, and their chief architect goes to the VP and says, so why are we not changing yet? And he's like, thank you. Because when you remove that burden, you educate people, you give them what the options are, they begin to think. Instead of challenging them, they become defensive and they're trying to hold their ground. So essentially, we can affect change, but at the same time, if you tell them, I don't like what you're doing, go figure out, they may not know what to do. That leads to paradox of choice oftentimes. And paradox of choice, when you have several options, we feel confused. We don't know what to take, what to use, what to do. And this is very hard for teams because they don't have a guidance. They don't know which direction to take. But if you're a leader who wants the change to be effected, there are two extremes you have to be mindful of. One extreme, that's one way to do it. The other extreme, I have no clue, go figure it out, we won't talk about it. Neither extremes are really good. So come up with a plan. Tell them a few things you want to do, but provide guidance to them. If you give them too many choices, it's too confusing, and you won't have a result at the end of the day. People talk endlessly, and then we looked at all of these, we don't have a clue what to do. So you want to really also constrain down to a few choices that are reasonable to consider, that becomes essential as well. So focus on not just the what you want to do, but also why you want to do this. Now, this is very shocking. This is also very scary. I got paid to come and consult for two weeks. So I travel out of town. I'm booked in a hotel. I show up to work on a Monday morning. I'm sitting down with the team, and I'm nervous because these are experienced programmers who are developing the software for this large company, a multi-billion dollar company. I'm the small guy. I'm sitting there listening to the team, and they want to implement a certain solution. And they're looking at me and saying, we want to implement the solution. We know you know this really well. Educate us. I said, I'll, I'll be happy to. I'm so happy being here. But can I ask you a question, please? Why are you doing this? And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, you're going to write the software. You're going to spend millions of dollars doing it. Why are you doing it? Um, we, we are doing it because we hate the solution we have right now. I said, hating the solution you have right now, that's a very logical reason. When you are done with this, can you explain to me how your users benefit from your change? And they looked at me and said, you're asking questions we don't really think about. We just don't like it. We want to change it. Fair enough. When you're done with this, tell me how does it make change to your company? How does it affect their bottom line? How does it affect their revenue? How does it affect their productivity? They're like, you're asking questions we never talk about here. We want to change this code. We want to do this. And then they go and invite their director. He comes and says, what are, what's your question? I ask these questions. He's like, whoa, how come nobody asked these questions before? And he looked at me and said, I'm really sorry, Venkat. I have bad news for you. We don't need you anymore. You can go. Because you just told us we're stupid. We didn't even bother to ask the question, why? I'm in a state of shock. The next day, he sends me an email. I saved the email for progeny's sake to write a book about it. <laughs> he sent the email saying, sometimes you're so close to a problem, you forget to ask why. And you run so fast in the wrong direction without even realizing we shouldn't be running in the first place. And, and that is something I see quite often. People get charged about a solution. And they're like, boom, let's go. But why are we going? Why are we doing this? Don't just stop by asking why, but also ask how after that. How do we achieve this is an important question too. Because if we don't understand how we will go through and implement it, it can be very difficult because there's no guidance and don't know what to do. So we have an idea. We want to implement it. How do we make this change? This could be anything you want, right? You want people to work from home. You want people to work from office. You want people to be hybrid. You want them to use a particular framework, a library, a concurrency library. You want them to change the way they have meetings. You want to have them change the way they use a particular product. You want to change the way they interact with customers, whatever it is. How do you go about doing this? 
The one first thing we want to do is to test it out. You have a great idea, you want to test it out. So you work on a small group, a smaller team. You find that it is working. But when you find it's working, don't just say it's working. Find why it's working. Because if you don't understand why it's working, you may take the same ideas and implement somewhere else, and it will fail because we didn't understand the underpinning of why it's working. And this is something we can learn quite a bit from experience of others in the world. So one such experience was a story behind Jerry Stein, uh, Sternin, and uh, he was called upon to go work in Vietnam. And he was hired because the death rate among the children, infants, was very high. And so the government called him and said, we need to come and help us. How can we save our infants, our children, the next generation? Why are they dying so early? So he goes in, looks around, and you can understand sometimes when you go to a country and you look at the chaos around you, you're like overwhelmed. You don't know what to do. And the worst thing he could have done is to tell everybody, your government is corrupt, you're all politicians, you're no good, I'll tell you how to fix it, change your government. This is the way maybe to get kicked out or even be arrested, right, in a foreign country. So that's not gonna help anybody. But he did something amazingly remarkable. And this is what I love about people's approach. His goal was not to fix the government. He was not called for that. His goal was not to tell people what they should do in their lives. He was not called for that. He was called for one single thing, deal with infant mortality. And sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes, I know this is hard, but sometimes you just have to take a deep breath and separate all the noise and nonsense around you. I'm not interested in fixing a thousand problems around me because if I try to fix a thousand problems, I fix nothing. But I want to fix one thing. And that's what he said. I want to fix one thing. That is the malnutrition of the children. And he then looked at people and he found that not all children were malnourished. There is a problem here. He ironically found that the poorer kids survive better than the richer kids which is mind-blowing, right? It's like, why would the richer kids die so quickly, the poorer kids are surviving so well? So he went down to the huts and the villages, sat down with the moms and said, moms, what are you doing? And he found out that they were using a type of shrimp in the food that the higher class people thought that they shouldn't really use in their food. But that was giving the nutrition for the children. So he found that one single thing, very cost effective, that's going to make a change. And the rest of his work was just to quietly promote that one small change in the meal. He went to moms and said, as you feed your children, don't change anything. Just add a little bit of this and see how it goes. And all of a sudden, the, 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 they are more better nutrition and they are getting better as well. And that is the key thing you want to always ask. When you work in companies, there's going to be one thing that's going to really be hard, but we have to fight against it. It's called the corporate politics. Corporate politics is the worst thing ever. And I learned this lesson very early in my life. And I learned to just smile away, right? You don't say anything to anybody because you always get caught. You are saying this to him or her. <laughs> yes, I agree. But I'm going to focus on this. You bring back the discussion to what you are after. And then they quickly realize you don't give a damn about politics. You keep going back to the problem you want to solve. You earn the trust of everybody, and you get to solve your problem and highlight the solution that works. This is a lesson I learned from this, ex uh, this experience report, is find the bright spot and just focus on that and replicate it. That can give us the results. But of course, success needs behavioral change and also we have to set new goals for it. People often say, I want all this change, but I don't want to change anything in what I do. You cannot get a different result if you don't do things differently. 
And this is true as an individual and as a group as well. So what are the things we can do to change, make that effective? This goes to uh, uh, you know, how, again, bigger problems can be very intimidating. This was back in the 90s in Brazil. They had an enormous problem of inflation. There was a huge amount of instability. And can you believe living in a life like this? You go to the store today to buy a, a can of milk. And tomorrow, the price is 80% higher. And the next day, it is higher. And the third day, it is higher. How would you feel if the price in the, on the shelves changes every day? It changes between morning and afternoon. People would go to the market, they will put labels on the food so they can buy it at a cheaper rate and get caught doing it because they were desperate and there was complete lack of hope. People were trying to steal things, they couldn't sustain it, <coughs> pardon me. How do you deal with a situation like this? So they had an enormous problem on their hand and to make things worse, their new finance minister of the time did not have any clue about what economics was. This is just the way politics is, right? So you hired somebody, it's like we sometimes do this, right? We hired somebody who has never done any programming. You're my boss. I used to have a boss like that. He was a great human, I will tell you that. But he would come and ask a question. I'm this guy who gets excited, you probably know this. And the minute he asks you, ask me a question, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. here's how we design, blah, blah. I'll go on with it. If you took my voice, uh, acoustics, it would go to him like this, take a steep curve like this, and go above him. Never anything went here. But he was really a good human. He would just keep looking at me. And then when I finish it, that's how I designed it. He would say, interesting. <laughs> uh, when will it be done again? Because that's all he cared about, right? But I've had bosses who were deeply technical. I would say something, they're like, let's see the code. Let's talk about the design. How does this work? And they're like, whoa, boss, that's pretty good, right? Well, they had a finance minister who had no clue what finance means and economic means. So how do you deal with a situation with people like that? But the guy was really smart. He didn't know what to do, but he knew he had to hire people who can do something about it. That's also a very smart idea, right? So he hires Bacha and three other people who were econ economists from Yale, and they had gone back to Brazil, and he hired them and said, find a way to fix it. So these guys, three guys, four guys, were sitting there scratching their head, how do we really solve this problem, which is of economic proportion, and they came up with the idea which is the most ridiculous idea you can think of. What they did, they introduced a fake currency. This was not even a real currency. Because the problem they saw was that people didn't understand what they're doing. Completely unstable. Every day the price is different. Hey, what's the price of milk? I don't know. Right? How do you even say what should be a price of milk? So they created this thing called URV which stands for unit of real value, which is really fake money. And they said, in URV, here's the price of milk, and that will not change. So every product started putting two prices on it. They started putting the actual price people are gonna pay of inflation and the real value. And people were like getting a little fooled but they're looking at it and they're saying, what's the price? Oh, it's this much today, but it is this in real. So it started giving the sense of stabilization, reality, sense of things are stable after all, it's not wild. And they waited for six months and swapped out the original currency and made the real, the fake money as the real money. And the economy stabilized. And now, how do you reason this? I cannot reason it, but I'm not, good news is I don't have to, I'm not an economist, but these guys are the ones and they figured it out. So there are times when you can find a novel way to do things. And you gotta try it, you gotta experiment it and figure out how it works. And you gotta see if you can change the behavior of the people. So people start thinking differently and then they start acting differently. And of course, eventually led to their strong economy after that. This all brings us one more thing. We are knowledge workers. We do deep thinking. We like to sit and stare at the wall, but we're not staring at the wall. We are thinking in our minds. How do we build this relationship between these objects? What kind of method should I call? How do I architect this? So we're thinking about all of this. 
And what we need, we don't use our physical strength. We use our mental strength. Our mental muscle is extremely important. But a mental muscle also gets tired. We are fatigued at the end of the day. Or not only end of the day, we're fatigued if things are not going well. Human mind is one of the most beautiful state machine. I will I'll remind myself this a lot. We are a state machine in the mind. You tell me, hey, Venkat, that's a good shirt. I'm like, thank you. No, it was not, but thank you, right? You say, are you okay? You look really sick. I'm like, really? And that's my state machine. It takes an input and responds with an output. So you keep feeding negative things in my mind, I'm going to feel down. You feed positive things in my mind, I feel good. And that's basically the mental state we are in. A code compiles, you're like, yes. Test passes, yes. Code doesn't compile, you're like, what's happening now, right? So we're dealing with the state machine all the time. The mental muscle, when it's really active, when you are sharp, you can get things done. How many times have you done this? You're sitting there and debugging a code, and you don't know why it's not working, and there are times I type things that doesn't even mean anything because I'm so tired, and you're like, you know what? I actually do this. I'm a, so, people are different. I'm a morning person. I'm not an evening person. There are few of us like that. I'm sure most of us are like, are you silly weird? We are an evening person, right? I go to bed at 11 p.m. and I will wake up at 12.30 a.m. and I'm super productive. But you ask me to stay awake for that one hour, I'm like dead man walking. I can't do that. That's just me. Give me an hour of sleep, I'm back running and I can solve problems. That's because I can recharge my mental muscle. So the mental muscle is something you want to think about. This makes a huge difference in what we do. Mundane work drains energy and lowers productivity. When you do silly things, you feel tired, you feel bored, you're not intellectually challenged. I tell you, write documentation. You're like, oh my god. <laughs> right? Most of us feel that way, right? Why? Because that's boring. But I tell you to write code. You're like, you, I can write code. I tell you, my code doesn't work. You're energized, let's fix it. Because we love those intellectual challenges, right? And mundane things drain us. You're told to sit in a meeting for seven hours. You're like, oh my gosh, please no. And we bring our laptops. We are sitting and coding in the meeting, right? Are you there in the meeting? I am. <laughs> so the point really is, we need to keep awareness of this mental muscle. Now, this was a story of the Titanic. When Titanic had trouble, the people who were supposed to send messages on Titanic, they were sitting there, their job is to send telegrams. And they told them, hey, passengers, these are rich people, they'll come and ask you to send telegrams, your job is to send them telegrams. These people were bored to death. Oh, uncle, uh, uncle wants to know how you're doing today. And they're all that, did you have your breakfast? This is the message they have to keep sending for these rich people. And they were like bored to their death. What are you doing? Sending these stupid messages to people? And they totally lost sight of the fact that they need to respond to a crisis. So because they were so bored to death, they didn't even pay attention to the problems that they have on hand. If you go about read the story of communication in Titanic, you'll be scared to see it. So this is one of the reasons why, if you want your team to make good decisions, don't ask them to do stupid things. This is really important. If they do stupid things, they're not going to be alert to do important things. So eliminate things they don't need to do. One of the things I eliminate in my life, I delegate anything I don't like to do. That's one thing I'm very good at doing. Hey, how, do you want to do this? No. <laughs> I hired this person to do it. Delegate, delegate, delegate. The only thing I want to do is things I like to do. Now, how many of us love cookies? Nobody? Of course, right? How many of us like radish? You're alone. <laughs> I hate this stuff. My mom used to feed this. I couldn't take it as a child. I didn't know better. Now I feel better. I'm not alone, not liking radish. They did an experiment. They took two groups of people, group who were asked to eat radish, and the group that was given cookies. 
both the groups were given the same problem. Guess what happened? The group that had cookies solved the problem. The group that had radish solved the problem. And they looked at the answer. And the group that ate cookie got almost all the answers right. And the group that ate radish, they were bored to death already because they had to re eat radish. That is emotionally draining for most of us. And they were like, I'm done. I'm exhausted eating this radish. Now, can you do this problem? No. So that's another thing. Maybe you don't want people to decide something. Order radish, right? You, uh, radish before the meeting. Hey, how did the meeting go? No decision was made, yay, right? <laughs> so something to think about. This really is not about radish or cookies. It's about mental muscle. When you're tired of doing something, you're not going to do it well. Environment matters. If you ask me one thing I do, I always think about my environment. I can, oh, by the way, I, I love working in noisy places. I go to Starbucks all the time. I'm sitting in Starbucks, and I'm sitting and people are just talking, crowded place, and guess what? I'm sitting there, and then I start recording, and there's a cone of silence around me. I don't hear anything. People often tell me, hey, we are here, can we talk to you? I said, absolutely, you can talk to me. Just don't expect me to listen. <laughs> so the point is, you can find your environment that works for you. In fact, it's so funny. I used to work in Starbucks. I mean, I would go to Starbucks and code all the time. So in the family, people would say, where's Venkat? Oh, he's in Starbucks. Where's Venkat? He's working in Starbucks. Those are so common that we didn't even realize it. One day, they went to my niece and said, where, is, where does Uncle Venkat work? And she said, oh, I think he's a barista at Starbucks. So she thought I actually work in Starbucks. And then they had to tell him, no, 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 he goes to Starbucks to work. He doesn't work in Starbucks. But the point is, you got to find an environment that works for you. And find the environment that gives you ability to focus on things so you can get the work done. This goes to another experience that we can learn from, and a very important one to think about. They studied the parole officers, and they wanted to see how many of the parole requests they approve, and how many they reject. And they started studying this. And what they found out was really funny. They would look at all the cases they considered, and, and this was in California, and they would look at the number of accepts for a parole. Granted, you can go, you are released. No, you're going to go back and spend another year in the jail. What made the difference? And they found a striking resemblance. The people who had their hearing in the morning, they mostly got out of the jail. The longer, the later in the day your hearing was, the more you went back to jail. So if you are called to have a parole hearing, what would you want? In the morning, if you want to go home. In the evening, if you want to stay there longer. But why? Because the officers would show up in the morning. Hey, how's it going, Joe? Doing great, Sarah. How's your evening? Let's, let's listen to these cases. And they're sitting there, they've had their lunch, and they're like tired. Now they are like, we don't want to make a mistake. We don't want to let somebody go and then get blamed. What's the easiest option? Reject. So they would start rejecting quickly in the afternoons, whereas in the mornings they were much more alert. They would be more thorough in considering, but they also were more reasonable. So this again comes back to the question. What do you do if you want your team to make decisions? Don't put them in a room for seven hours. That's not going to work for you. In, to get your results, create frequent breaks. I know this is a lot harder, right? We gotta get going, we got more things to do. But take frequent breaks. If you take a frequent break, give them a pass, ask them to go around, walk around, walk outside the building, get some refresh, uh, fresh oil, uh, fresh um, air, <laughs> oil, fresh air. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been driving electric cars now, so I have a longing for oil uh, driven cars. So, so get some fresh air. Uh, gosh, kind of stuff come, that comes from my mouth. So, so get some air, you know, eat some cookies, no radishes, right? Come back to the meeting and see how this goes. So have frequent meetings that can make a big difference as well. Look out for confirmation biases. This happens a lot. Somebody is so convinced this is the way to do it. 
And they will hear everything you say. And then they would nod the head and say the same thing they said before. Like, nope, that's not what I said. So confirmation biases are really, really enormous in conversations. You want to keep an eye on it for ourselves and for others as well. And finally, I would say, give them the support. You want to make a change. So a company that I work for, they said, we want to do automated testing. And the boss didn't go and, to the team and say, we should do automated testing, go. He didn't do that. Instead, he said, we're going to do automated testing. There's no option. But I'm going to hire somebody who's extremely good at it. And he's not going to come and talk. He's going to pair with you and do automation testing with you until you can be on your own doing it. This was real commitment. This is what he said. He said, I'm going to bring you the support. We're going to make this happen. I'm not going to hold you to this without giving you the support. I'm not going to blame you. Instead, I'm going to provide you the support. So if you want the effect change, just don't tell the team, go do it. Give them the support. Ask them. We want to succeed in this. What do you think I should do for you to succeed? If the team says, we would need this, we need that, see what's reasonable. What can you make happen? And provide them the support. Because if you want them to really succeed, you got to provide the support for them. And finally, I would say, provide them things that can, they can use to learn and see why this is important. This is strange, right? You, you would think doctors and nurses know better. So they put an announcement. Doctors, nurses, you should wash your hands. What a concept, right? And they found most doctors and nurses don't wash their hands. So how do you make a change among the people who should know? You're not going to educate doctors and nurses, right? Washing is good for you. But they're not doing it. Why? It never clicked. So literally what they did was they started really taking these surfaces, like the surface of a door that's near the bathroom, and various surfaces, and they started swabbing it. They put pictures of germs on each one of them on the wall. And they said, that's the germ this morning, by the way. People are like, oh my goodness, I better start washing my hand. And guess what? They continued displaying this, and the germ on the display kept going because people started washing their hands more. So sometimes that feedback is important and useful. This is what I like to do. Near the coffee machine, put a display and show how your products are doing. Display the number of tests passing, for example. Tell me the production problems. How many servers are down? What is the response rate of your servers? So any SLA metric you are interested in having, display them on the wall. When people can see it, they react to it differently because it's very tangible in front of them. So they're going to take effect on it so you can make effect on that as well. So I want to summarize a few things I talked about today so you can take away a few things to consider. So how do you effect change? I would say convince yourself first. Because if you're not able to convince yourselves, there's no point in trying to convince others. Address the problem, but don't push one solution. First, understand the problem, but don't push one solution. Educate your team. There is no compromise to it. Let the team explore, because then there's a buy-in from them, and they're committed to doing what you want to do. Provide a clear path to, them, path to them. Show them what your goals are and where you want them to go and why you want them to go. Find what works and amplify it. Don't try to you know, be philosophical about it. Hey, this solution worked. Can we replicate that same solution, not get carried away by all the other things we can do? So find what works and amplify it. Introduce behavioral goals and behavioral changes so people can embrace the ideas you are promoting. Remove activities that drain their energy. Don't, as an example, one thing I refuse to do in companies is fill out timesheets. Stupidest thing ever. Why should I fill a timesheet? My boss will say, fill a timesheet. Hey, I worked 80 hours this week. What do I put? 40. I used to call it time lies because you're lying, right? Why, if, if, I can, if you want me to fill 40, why do you want me to do it? Do a machine do it. Or find an assistant to do it, not me. I'm much more worth than that. I'm not going to be spending my time filling timesheets when I can be doing creative work. So don't let people do stupid things. Eliminate stupidity from their work. And uh, remove activities that drain their energy. Keep an eye on the energy level. How are people doing? And, and take frequent breaks to re-energize them. Watch out for confirmation biases. 
support positive encouragements and bring them support and also use emotional motivators that clearly show them that things are working or they are not. And when they do make a change, they can see it's working. That feedback loop is really, really amazing when they can make use of it. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much for being here.